I'm not making any money talking these days. Good Christ, 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 Christ. <laughs> Dick, folks. I'm not gonna lie to you. Still am. I guess I am a decent guy because I'm a, a, I'm a fucking jerk, uh, and I'm not a jerk. Apparently, I'm a dick. I'm not an awful guy, but I've just I've done so much ridiculous stuff. Man, I am. Uh, man, I'm an awful guy. Hey, what's happening, Mike Schmidt, Forty Year Old Boy Podcast, coming to you this week, uh, episode nine of the Forty Year Old Boy Podcast, episode nine of what was uh, almost an eight episode series. Not going to lie to you folks, because uh, I'm coming to you live this week from, not live, again, I don't understand why I say live, but I do, because I'm a retarded person, but I'm coming to you from uh, Burbank, California this week. I know that's very different. Usually I'm in Riverside or I am in uh, Valley Village, California. I can tell you I will no longer be coming to you from Riverside. That's not going to be a problem uh, in the future as uh, the goateed monster, young Eric Butterfield, who's uh, actually it was his idea to do this podcast, has gracefully bowed out and will no longer be producing said show. Uh, I can't blame him. The guy's got a serious life. You know, this guy's got a real life. I mean, I'm I'm an idiot. I sit around and I talk and uh, honestly, for a year was waiting for somebody to write me and go, dude, I'll do all the work if you just want to talk. Fantastic. I'm in. Uh, and Eric just happened to be that guy. And uh, now Eric is out. Yeah, because uh, Eric sent me an email last week, shortly after we recorded episode eight, saying that he was, uh, uh, unfortunately, tied up. The guy's got too much of a life going on. And, uh, I, you know, I'm going to leave it to you folks to speculate as to whether or not his wife might have had something to do with that. I'm not going to go ahead and guess. I certainly don't want to put forward any sort of theory that would prove to be untrue. But I will say that Eric, uh, I mean, this is a guy, dude, this guy, a, he's a normal guy. I, he, he took it upon himself to go ahead and do this show. He went ahead and, uh, uh, you know, sent me a note, said, let's do it. This, you know, we would record on Tuesdays. He would have to, add, uh, and then he, this is a guy, he got up at 4.30 in the morning to go to work. So he would get up at 4.30 in the morning on Tuesday, go to work, and then I would either come to Riverside and meet him, or he would come and meet me in Valley Village. Either way, he wouldn't get to bed in, uh, in time, and then he'd have to get up at 4.30 on, fr on Wednesday morning. On Friday morning, yes, he would sleep. He would go to bed Tuesday night and then sleep until Friday morning uh, because his job is as uh, he's a Rumpelstiltskin impersonator at a uh, local fair. So that uh, I don't know why he's so tired. That seems like a job Taylor made to get some sleep. But uh, he is a guy who would get up at 4.30 in the morning and then get home at like 2 in the afternoon and then have to edit my show all night uh, and then have to deal with me calling him and going, no, I want you to stop the Van Halen song at 1 minute and 18 seconds, not 1 minute and 21 seconds. Who the fuck do you think you are? And uh, I'm a dick, folks. I'm not going to lie to you. It's, come, it's become very apparent to me that I am a jag off. And, uh, and it's in listening to this show that I realize it and I laugh and I go, man, uh, I, I, seem to, I thought I was a decent guy. And I still am. I guess I am a decent guy. I'm just, uh, I just got foibles. I got, I'm fastidious. I got a lot of other things that begin with F that have to do with me. And uh, I don't know. I learn about them every time I hear the show back. So, so the bottom line is Eric uh, is no longer involved with the show. And I, I have to say right now, Eric Butterfield, I thank him so much because if it's not for him, I'm not doing this show. That guy, uh, you know, with a, a very generous offer and gave of his time and uh, gave of his experience and uh, gave of his ammunition when we went to the Riverside uh, shooting range. He was right there with the bullets. So he provided content for that episode. And uh, I can't thank Eric enough. He was very cool and uh, and very gracious in, in his time and his efforts. And uh, I'm thrilled. And I'm, I'm very disappointed that he's not still involved because, you know, there was nothing better than having a guy who really thought you were funny hanging around. That was great. It would be like having an Ed McMahon, like a, like a sidekick who hung out with you all the time. And every time you would talk, they'd just go, ha, 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 yes, absolutely, sir. Uh, how great would that be? It, it would be like having your own theme music, which I've always wanted to when you walk into a place and like, you know, you're, which is why I'm so uh, queer about the music with this show. Uh, that's about, I mean, I, back, even from when I was a kid and I would play the wrestling game, like we'd play wrestling and I would, I had to have, every wrestler had to have a different theme song. So literally we'd be in the yard going to wrestle and then hold on, got to get the boom box and change the tape and play back in the saddle by Aerosmith. I mean, it was just like retarded. So, uh, but that's who I am and, and that's what I do. So uh, coming to you live this week from Burbank, California, uh, in the studio, of my friend Lily, who we all learned about last week and her nudity and uh, dancing skills. And uh, we're going to be having her produce the show. I figure she's going to get through probably four. 
I don't think I don't think she's going to make eight. She's probably going to do four. And uh, and then I'm I'm open to suggestions. Anybody wants to write me and go ahead and give them their time. Uh, and it's funny because when Eric chose to do the show, when Eric asked me uh, if he could do the show, one of the conditions. I said, Eric, I said, man, I would love to do it. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, it, it's really cool. But after we get like a couple months under our belt, I, 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 and by the way, I said a couple of months on purpose because it meant that that was two months that I wouldn't have to work. But I said to him, uh, you know what, let's get a couple of months under our belt. And then I need you to show me step by step everything I need to do to do the show myself. Because I knew, I guess, somewhere in my uh, blackest heart that eventually... Eric was going to take a powder and I was going to, you know, because he, again, not, again, not because I'm a jag off, even though I am, but, uh, I think mainly because the guy's a real, got a real life. He's got sh shit going on. So, and this is before I knew his wife wanted me dead. So, uh, I, I said, you know, you can show me everything. And unfortunately the relationship didn't last long enough and he took off. So I don't still don't know what to do except talk. Uh, and so now I'm here and uh, my friend Lily knows what to do. She's got her Behringer mixing board here on the, on the, uh, studio, uh, table. And by table, by the way, on studio, I mean kitchen. I'm, I'm sitting in her kitchen. What am I, <laughs> who am I kidding with a studio? Just cause it, it, literally nowadays, if you have a laptop computer fucking anywhere is your studio, you can say, Hey, you want to go to my studio at Starbucks and record something? Yes, of course I do. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're in her kitchen now with a, and I have a headset mic and I'm really uncomfortable with it. It's very odd because, uh, Eric had a, a freestanding mic. So I had headphones on, but then I could like lean and lean back and kind of talk into the microphone and stuff. But now I, I, I feel like I have uh, this thing attached to my head and every time I talk, it's going to make it, uh, it's going to pick it up. And it's true because that's what microphones do. Listen, folks, I, I don't know if you have any idea what a microphone does, but apparently if you speak into it, it's going to record everything you say for posterity and put it down on tape. Uh, and by the way, for posterity, I mean for not posterity because there's no way that this is interesting to anybody. Uh, so there you go. That's, uh, that's what microphones do. And, and look, hey, I'm learning. I got that technical knowledge. I know that much. I know that a microphone picks up what you say and records it for you. Fantastic. I'm well on my way to producing the show myself, uh, which is going to be the case because, again, Lily is going to take a powder because I am a jerk. So here I am in uh, in Lily's kitchen. I'm wearing a, a headset microphone with the with the wrapper on mic in front of your mouth. So I, uh, I I could be doing a podcast or I could be uh, taking your order and getting you extra fries and a cheeseburger because it's it's one of those it, those headsets that you see. And by the way, although I shouldn't say that because this thing is like big and fucking clunky. It's like half a ball gag, honestly. But if you go to Jack in the Box, I went to Jack in the Box the other, at like four in the morning a couple days ago because uh, I was bored. And that's what I do when I'm bored. I fucking get a breakfast burrito. God forbid I read a book. Uh, and that's why I'm a house. So we, uh, I, I go there and the guy working at Jack in the Box at four in the morning has this amazing headset on. It looks like a little Bluetooth thing, but it had crazy red lights on it and it was sleek. It was in his ear. And, uh, and I'm thinking to myself, man, why is Jack in the Box the vanguard of fucking technology? And, and it, honestly, it's fast food. And, and porn. Those are the two industries that for some reason adapt technology faster than anybody else. You go to the bank, you still got to wait in line with like nine people while one person calls your name. But if you want a cheeseburger, you want to jerk off, everything happens at light speed. So Eric is gone and Lily is in. And, uh, and I, here's something that will, uh, will suffer. I can tell you this for sure. Uh, Eric, for some reason, knew everything I'd ever spoken about. He was a guy who, uh, when I would say something, he would go, you've said that before, or you've, you've covered it. And uh, uh, he was real good at that. Lily has no idea. So if I wind up repeating myself, you guys are going to be like, uh, is he, I mean, seriously, is he losing it? Did he just, is he fucking going crazy? Uh, no, I'm not going crazy. I'm just a guy who talks and forgets what he says. Uh, and Eric was a guy who was uh, uh, really good at keeping track of that. So if I wind up repeating myself, I apologize. Go ahead and send all emails to uh, I really don't fucking care dot com. So I can't wait to get those. Uh, <laughs> and it, it's funny. It, it This whole incident with Eric has taught me and it doesn't really taught me anything. It, it made me think, you know, I joke about being a dick like that. I, it is, I'm just a jerk and uh, and I'm not a jerk. I'm a nice guy. It's just I guess I have jerky tendencies. Uh you know, sitting in a guy's house and, and talking about his wife for 10 minutes while he's sitting there and she's in the other room, that's probably a jerky tendency. And uh, and it probably didn't help uh, uh, continue our working relationship. I'm not going to lie. But at the same time, it fucking happened. I mean, how was I not supposed to touch on it? I'm, I That house was so tense, it was ridiculous. Uh, so there you go. So, uh, uh, but, you know, it's... I, I, I've, and I've lost friendships uh, over over the years. I used to work on another show, uh, a show called Never Not Funny, uh, with Jimmy Pardo and Matt Belknap. And uh, that fell apart because apparently I'm a dick, I guess. I mean, I, that's that's the vibe I got. Uh, you know, something happened and it was, it was a long, arduous thing. A lot of things happened and, and uh, that contributed to it. 
Uh, and it, but it makes me feel terrible. And it makes me think, you know, am I that bad of a guy? Because I, you know, I have friends, like my only friends really, I guess, that I can consider are friends that I grew up with. And these are guys, these are guys who've known me since I was 11 and they have stuck around. So, I mean, am I that bad? Or can we look at it this way? Are those guys as big a dicks as me? And therefore, we just are like the, the, these guys who, who can tolerate one another. Literally, we're the only, because none of us like anybody else. I mean, all of us will always, my, my buddy Dave, my buddy Max, and I will joke about it all the time. It's just like, man, I, you know what? I'm 40. I don't need any more friends. I got all the friends I'm ever going to have. And by that, I mean me and Dave. That's it. I don't have any other friends. I don't have anybody else that I hang out with or talk to. It's uh. And it's like, I sound like, uh, you know, a woman crying about it, but I'm not. I'm just telling you the truth. That's the way it is. It's, it's, it's weird. It's like, am I a bad guy? And when I'm going to therapy, I sit there and I talk to the lady and, and uh, the lady. That's what I call her, by the way, when I show up. She's the, she's the therapy lady. <laughs> she's the, oh, hey, look, the lady's here who listens to me talk about when I was a kid. Uh, idiot. So, uh, but I, I, I wonder if it's, am I a bad guy? Uh, and if so, what does it say about the three guys who stuck with me my whole life? Are they bad guys? And I can answer uh, in the affirmative on one of them. My buddy Dennis, he is a jag off. Uh, you think I'm bad. Dennis is a guy because he is the guy in our group who is notorious for being a, a guy that everybody fucking hates. Like, they, you know, we we love him. I love Dennis. He's like the best guy ever. And he is a guy. You ever see the movie? It's a Wonderful Life. At the end of the movie, when uh, uh, everything, uh, uh, I, by the way, spoiler alert for a movie from 1911. If you haven't seen it, you might want to turn off the show now because I'm about to give something away. Uh, at the end, Jimmy Stewart is uh, rallying from uh, some setbacks. Let's do it. That, there, that's enough of a spoiler. I'll couch it in that. Jimmy Stewart is rallying from some setbacks and uh, all of these people in town, because he's a good guy, they start bringing him cash and they start doing everything they can. And then he gets a telegram from Sam Wainwright, who is a munitions expert or whatever, and a plastics guy. I don't remember what he was, but he basically tells Jimmy Stewart in a, in a telegram, uh, that he's going to give him whatever he needs. And uh, Dennis is my Sam Wainwright. If anything ever happened, I know that I could call Dennis and he would uh, he would take care of business. Uh, unfortunately, he would have to run it by his wife, Monica, first. And I don't know how she, on board she would be, but I can tell you that Dennis is gung-ho to help me out with whatever I need to, and he has in the past. Anything that happens, I can call Dennis and I know he can take care of it. And uh, and But but at the same time, it doesn't mean that he's not a dick, because he is, man. He is... It, when I was, we were kids one time, we went to, uh, uh, we were at a Golden Bear restaurant. I just, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Did that hurt anything? I just, I literally, I'm in a chair with wheels on it for the first time. And I rolled forward and my knee hit the table that all the equipment's on and everything shook like there was a goddamn earthquake. That was brutal. Did I, did I jump anything? Did the needle move? You can talk. Okay, good. She gave, she gave me the thumbs up and winking and I'm like, enough. I don't, you know, we're, you're not trying to pick me up in an adult bookstore. Just go ahead and say, fine. Uh, <laughs> so she just, you know, th oh, brutal. So, uh, and what was I talking about? So Dennis, so yeah, Dennis and I were at the golden bear restaurant and, uh, uh, I think we dined, did we dine and dash that night? I think I did, but, uh, we're, we're there eating and there's these old women and Dennis, Dennis is a guy who really has no filter and doesn't censor himself. He swears like all the time everywhere. If you thought that I said fuck a lot in the first three episodes of this show, you wouldn't even be able to listen to Dennis. I mean, Dennis opens his mouth and it's literally like a blue cloud comes out because he's swearing so much. And uh, so we're doing that in line to leave. And there are these old people behind us and uh, they're, we can hear them. They're appalled at Dennis's language. And they're just like, oh, can you believe he's using that kind of language? I, it just And in public, oh, it's unbelievable. His parents, they're just talking. And Dennis is looking me, now Dennis and I are looking each other right in the face, okay? And the old ladies are to my right, to Dennis's left, behind us, okay? And uh, Dennis is looking, and he's like, all right, well, we're going to get out of here. We're going to head off. To, he, and, and he stops, and, and he can hear them. They're like, oh, Lord. And he's like, oh, fuck. You know what, Mike? You really can't like coming to get something to eat and getting ripped on. And then he wheels his head really fast. And I mean, he's nose to nose with this old lady. And he goes, by one of the golden girls. Have a good fucking night, ladies and walks out of the golden bear just just drops an f-bomb right in her face and splits and in the commotion of course i then hid my check underneath the cash register and left without paying because that's what i did when i was a kid i never paid for a meal anywhere because i was a slob uh because <laughs> because dining and dashing was funny that's what i would do uh, retarded but uh but that's dennis man dennis uh when he was living in new york my friends went out to stay with him on uh, uh you know it, they went to Times Square for New Year's Eve and stuff like that. And he had a gay roommate. And uh, uh, the gay roommate had a friend also stay over. 
And uh, then in the you know morning, everybody's kind of out in the in the living room. And uh, Dennis is like, all right, we ready to take off, guys? And he walks out, and he has a jar of Vaseline in his hands, and he throws it to his gay roommate, and he goes, clean up your squeak, you goddamn queen. You kept me up all night. Clean up your squeak, you goddamn queen. Oh, my Christ. Who says something like that? My friend Dennis. Uh, but still, the, one of the best guys I've ever met. I mean, Dennis, my three friends, Dennis and, and uh, Max and Jeff are the three guys I grew up with and still talk to to this day. I don't talk to Jeff as much, uh, you know, because he's, they're all married with kids. All of them are married and they have kids. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm godson to, to Max's uh, son, Val. And uh, I don't talk to Jeff as much. Jeff, Jeff is, uh, <laughs> Jeff, I used to, you know, Jeff was insane when we were kids, but then as he got older and he got married, he, he was the one who went, you know what? I think I'm going to grow up. I think I'm going to go ahead and stop acting like a jackass. And uh, so he has his, his wife and kids. And it's so funny because we, we always, whenever we get together in a room, you can always bet that we're going to talk about high school. We always joke about what happened in school and we, and we'll bring up names of people like the, and, and Jeff, and Jeff's wife, Sharon hates it. She cannot stand it. She's just like, why does this always come up? And it's like, we don't know why, because it's ridiculous. It makes us laugh. It's so stupid. Uh, you can bet that eventually, within like 10 minutes of us being in a room, Emmanuel Skatidis is going to get mentioned. He's a guy we went to high school with, and, and he's just going to get brought up for no reason. And then Sharon, of course, will look at us and go, you guys are fucking idiots. And yes, we are. There's no doubt about it. I call Jeff the amorphous peg, because Jeff used to be... Like a, he was insane. He was when we were kids. Uh, but then as he got older, he's the guy who uh, he will do anything to fit in with anybody. Hey, guys, what's going on? Hey, I hope everything's going well. And he's not that much of a pussy about it, but it's still funny to hear him talk because he's, you know, he he was the guy. Let's put it this way. Jeff is the guy that all of the wives love. That's 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 why he's the amorphous peg, because they all think that he's this really sweet, nice guy. But they never saw him when he was punching a homeless guy in the face in Chicago. So they have no idea that Jeff would do anything like that, that Jeff was drunk and charged out of the car to a homeless guy. And I had to grab him and drag him back into the car. They're, Jeff is, they don't know that Jeff's the guy who, when we were talking about our friend, Eric Smith, Jeff was drunk and just went, Smith's a prick. He needs his ass kicked in the middle of like uh, the car for no reason. He wanted to go at two in the morning and beat up Eric Smith at his house. So, the, the, but the wives all think Jeff is the greatest. They're like, oh, Jeff is the best. They don't know that Jeff, here's something Jeff did. Jeff and I used to work at Jewel. We were baggers in a grocery store. And, uh, and then one day we went to breakfast, uh, at Ponderosa. Ponderosa is like a sizzler. I don't know if they have them everywhere, but they used to have them in the, in the Midwest and they had a breakfast buffet. Uh, and believe me, fat Mike was going to a breakfast buffet. What's that? All you can eat eggs. I'm in. Cause is there anything more appetizing than all you can eat eggs? God knows you want to shove as many eggs as you can. And until your heart explodes, just fucking eat them until your heart goes off like an atomic bomb right in your chest. Uh, and it's not even eggs, too, when you go to those places. It's that powdered shit that they mixed with water that made a pan of yellow. But for some reason, you were like, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and shovel all of these down my throat. So we go to breakfast buffet at Ponderosa one time. And it's me, Chris Shabika, and Jeff, my buddy Jeff. And uh, we wind up there, and we're eating, and uh, and we're killing time. And then when we leave, uh, for some reason, I don't know why they did this. I don't know if it was a policy back then that they've changed or if we just somehow made it a policy. They had, like, doggy bags. With a buffet. Who does that? You can't do that. Especially when a big fat guy's there. So I filled up these bags. We took, I'm going to, I'm going to say a rough estimate. We took 240 waffles. That's what I'm going to guess. We took 240 Eggo waffles that they had cooked and laid out and just shoved them in a bag to take them. And there was a, they had for some reason a pan that had onions and peppers, just like sauteed green onions and peppers. And I don't know if that was a side dish or a meal or an accoutrement or something you were supposed to put on the powdered eggs. I have no idea. But all I know is I filled up uh, two buffet bags, two all-you-can-eat you know, takeaway bags with sautéed peppers and onions and Chinese noodles. You know those crunchy ones? Uh, like the, uh, the, the you know, chow mein noodles, basically. And I shoved them in there and I called it because I was eating it at breakfast. I called it the Sino-Japanese salad. So I was eating it, and then I said, you know what, I'm going to take some Sino-Japanese salad on the road. So we take all the waffles, and we take the Sino-Japanese salad, and we're driving. And uh, as we're driving in Jeff's car, uh, of course, what happens when you're in a car? You think to yourself, how can we cause some mischief right now at 11 o'clock in the morning? So we decided to drive around and throw waffles at people. Now we're driving... And, and waffles are great to throw because they fly. I mean, it's not just like you're just whipping. So we would come around and we would see people on the road 
and you would just fucking whip a waffle. I mean, who gets a waffle thrown at them? But it doesn't matter. Jeff is driving. He's laughing his ass off. Me and Shabika are hanging out of the car, and we're just whipping waffles. So there's a kid. He's mowing his lawn. We come up on the guy. We come around the corner. He's mowing his lawn. Imagine this. You're mowing your lawn. You look, and you just hear, hey. You look. Two guys are hanging out of their car. They just throw waffles like fucking shurikens, like throwing stars. They come flying at you. And they just, and they did. It was great because they're like, they're heat-seeking missiles. And he's just looking at us mowing the lawn. He's like, ha. Ah! And the waffles go flying at him. We drive off. So we find some more people. Then we go by Darren Chisholm's house. Darren Chisholm was a kid we went to high school with. His mom and dad are coming out of the house. His mom and dad are walking out. They're locking up their front door. We just come around the corner. Boom! We just fucking whip waffles at Mr. and Mrs. Chisholm. They go flying off the porch. They bank off their mailbox. They fucking, what the hell? So we drive. Uh, Jeff's laughing. We're hilarious. We're, and it's, hey, come on. You're throwing waffles at people. It's beautiful. So then we come around the corner. There's the kid mowing his lawn again. And he sees us, he lets go of the lawnmower and just lets it keep going and sprints, just runs as fast as he can to go into his house. And we're like, the hell with that. Ching, ching, ching. We just fucking whip waffles at him. <laughs> they come flying. He dives, dives behind his car in his driveway. It was awesome. So it was like, and he doesn't, you know what? He doesn't care that he's going to hit by waffles. Waffles don't hurt, but he's in on the game. It was gorgeous. He played along. And his lawnmower is just like driving on its own. He dives onto his driveway as waffles go flying at him. Awesome. So we do this, we throw the waffles, and then we're out of waffles after an hour of fun, and we can't stop laughing. So then Jeff goes to drop me off at my house, and uh, we, he had to turn around in a cul-de-sac. So he turns down this cul-de-sac, and there's kids playing in the cul-de-sac, and, uh, you know, little kids, probably like eight years old, and uh, they wouldn't get out of the way of the car. And, uh, and Jeff pulls up, and he's waiting for them to move, and they're playing, and they wouldn't move, because I guess... When kids are, uh, first of all, if you know what a cul-de-sac is, it's like a court or a cul-de-sac. It's a dead end circle where there's just houses. So kids I'm imagining are probably used to just playing there and not used to a lot of cars coming. So they don't really move because they figure no cars are going to come down in their neighborhood, their little cul-de-sac. These kids wouldn't move. So uh, Jeff and I are like 17 years old, 18 years old. And uh, we start honking the horn, <laughs> you know, get out of the way, kids, whatever. So they stand up and this little girl stands in front of our car. Like all of a sudden she's basically taking a Tiananmen Square stand against our fucking car and she's standing there looking in the window at us as we sit there looking at her and she's probably like seven this little girl and she's just like stop stop because whenever jeff honked the horn like it was too loud so jeff goes around her she's standing in the middle of the street she actually did it she tiananmen squared us she made us go around her so we go around the little girl and we stop and she looks in she said you should stop blowing your horn i took a handful of the sino japanese salad and blasted her right in the face I mean, she is standing, she's like six. She's six years old. She's looking at me in the car. We pull up and I'm reaching in and she's doing it. And she's going, you guys should stop. That horn is too loud. Honk. A huge handful. Uh, and, cause I'm, I, and look, I can palm a basketball. I got a pretty big hand. I, I scooped out essentially the con contents of one full bag of Sino-Japanese salad and blasted this little girl with it. Just covered her from head to toe. She's standing there. In, she's covered in peppers and onions. Who, who throws that at somebody? What kind of animal throws peppers and onions at somebody? I do, goddammit. So this little girl is now, now she's standing in her cul-de-sac, and we got to turn around. So we got a brave going back past her, but it doesn't matter. She's out of commission at this point. It might as well have been like a Spider-Man web that I blast, because she can't even move. So we go up in the cul-de-sac, and we turn around to go home, and she's just standing there, ah, 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 like little kids when they just cry for no reason. But uh, there's a big reason at this point, because she is covered in, in butter, onions and peppers along with and and crunchy chinese noodles and they're falling off her so the our wives they don't know that jeff they know the nice guy jeff who will pull out your chair and smile and you know wear a kiss to cook apron they don't know jeff when he was throwing vegetables in little kids faces uh although i guess technically he didn't really he was just the bag man he was the bag man he was the wheel man he was driving while i was throwing vegetables in little kids faces but still and uh and i you know i've thought of sometimes about that little kid and just thought to myself if she remembers that and if like to this day, like she can't eat onions because of it, like, and I, we should have, I, part of me wanted to stick around and see the carnage, like wanted to see the, her mom come out and the confusion on the mom's face as she looked down and said, you're, you're covered in a side dish. How does that happen? I mean, I can understand if you had a fight or, you know, you got muddy or dirty or you're out here playing, but how are you covered with, with uh, condiments? That makes no sense at all. So, I, and I just, that kid to this day, like, must be sickened by the smell of, it. it's like napalm. You know, vet, Vietnam vets, they get the smell and they're like, oh man, it takes me right back to Da Nang. Well, this kid is just like, they, someone saw Tang Onion, she's like, it was a warm day in Bolingbrook. 
was in a cul-de-sac. It's a story I don't care to tell. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's the Jeff that people don't remember, that people don't know. And uh, but yeah, that, that's the guys I grew up with. And then, then they've stuck with me, and it's like I guess uh, you know maybe maybe we all are. Well, they've grown up though. They're like I said, they've got kids. I don't have any kids to worry about. Uh, I, I I am I'm just a giant. I'm the forty year old boy. That's why I called it that because I got no kids and I got no uh, I got I got no future. What am I talking about? I got my buddy Dave. I talked to uh, Max. I know listens to the show, so he's gonna hear this and he's gonna. <laughs> but uh, Max doesn't. I wonder if he remembers this. When Max, because uh, I used to, you know, I, I've told stories about fighting on here. I think one of the reasons I fought, you know, when I grow up is because I used to get my ass beat as a kid. I mean, and so I'm trying to make up for lost time after getting my ass whipped so much. Uh, you know, my older brother Lenny used to beat my ass, and I was for some reason I wouldn't fight back. And then the day I fought back. I punched Lenny in the face as hard as I could and just ran. Like, literally sprinted nine miles to get away from him, you know, until, until he, because I knew he was going to get a catch me, he was going to beat the shit out of me. But, uh, yeah, I was just that guy. I fought, I got into a fight one time in high school, and uh, we were at a football game. And, uh, and again, for no reason. It wasn't even our, it wasn't even our high school playing. It was, it was Romeoville High School against Andrew. It was a playoff game. And I went to Bolingbrook High School. I had nothing to do with this, but we hated Romeoville, so we went to the game anyway to root for Andrew. That's, again, that's the, what you're dealing with. That's the mentality you're dealing with here. And uh, we go to the game, and we're cheering for Andrew, and, uh, and I'm, I'm very vocal I'm, when I'm cheering for Andrew. I'm actually, like, spelling out, you know, Andrew, give me an A. Like, I mean, just awful, really retarded, stupid shit that you look back on now and go, why didn't somebody beat my ass? Well, guess what? Somebody did beat my ass. Because, uh, well, like I said, we were rooting for Andrew, but I don't, I don't remember how it happened. But somehow the Andrew people hated us too because we were so obnoxious. Like it was, it was pretty obvious because we're wearing Bolingbroke jackets and all that that we were there just to cause trouble. So the Andrew people, I don't know if they just decided to go ahead and uphold sportsmanship on their own, but they didn't want us rooting for them. Like we were bad luck. I don't know. So they're ripping Bolingbroke and then we're ripping Andrew. And uh, basically, the Andrew guy calls me out. So now it's like, all right, well I'm gonna have to fight this guy. This is gonna happen. So uh, my buddy Max comes up to me before I fight. Uh, Max and I are, are very much alike in the in the way that we grew up. Like you know, we have. Other people had normal lives and stuff like that, but we had weird childhoods. You know, I've told you a little bit about mine. You know, my uh, I was raised by my mom alone and, and stuff like that. Uh, well, Dave, uh, I won't go into details, but let's put it, this is who Dave is. Dave came up to me. This is high school. Before I'm going to fight a guy in high school, Dave hands me a knife. Just says, here, take this. And I take it. I don't know if he thinks I'm going to gut the Andrew guy like a fish and bleed him out on the field because I, you know, part of me actually wishes I'd done it. Part of me actually wishes I'd taken the knife and the Andrew guy comes at me to fight and I just, like a movie, just shank him and then pull up like a zipper, just zipper him up to his, his Adam's apple and then everybody just looks at me and goes, what are you doing? Part of me wishes I'd have done that just to see the response of everybody and part of me wishes I'd have done it because then I wouldn't have gotten my ass kicked as bad as I did by the Andrew guy because he wailed on me. It was like, it was like he jumped me and he started punching me and I did this, uh, like I had enough in me where there was enough adrenaline to where I fought him off and I stood up and I was like, is that all you got? And I remember everybody going, yeah, like they were so happy. And then I still proceeded to get my ass beat at that point, but I did have one moment of glory. Uh, but when this guy jumped me and I'm on the ground, I felt uh, a pressure on my chest. Like I didn't know what it was uh, in the middle of the fight. And uh, at the end of the fight, we're walking away and Dan Laporta comes up to me and he's just like, dude, he goes, uh, you all right? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, uh, he goes, that guy kicked you in the chest so hard. If your chest was a football, it would have gone 50 fucking yards. Like if it was a punt, because it was like, because I heard everybody go, oh, when he did it. And I felt the pressure on my chest. And, uh, and then I knew it, uh, the next three days that I had, cause I couldn't breathe. Like I, I had a bruised sternum and I just, the worst, like black and blue and yellow fucking thing on my chest and couldn't breathe. So yeah, cause uh, I got uh, just fucking blasted. And, and the thing is, that's who I was as a kid. I avoided, like, I, I was supposed to fight this guy, Larry Bagwell, and avoided it. And, like, to this day now, I've even joked about it. Uh, I think I joked about it Never Not Funny, and I've written it in blogs. Like, I can't stop obsessing about Larry Bagwell. He's in fucking jail now. I mean, this guy, you know, he's he's gone off and lived a life of crime. And still, I think to myself, God, I wish I could have fought him. I'm 40. Grow up. I can't. I don't do, uh, you know, uh, it's funny, Max. Uh, Max is a guy who wants to do things things that like that I do I think but he won't do them like he he thinks I'm hilarious but also he thinks he just cringes at the horrible things that I do we went to our uh <laughs> we went to our 20th high school reunion uh there's a girl uh named Barb Wolf that for some reason I don't get along with uh I do sort of but I guess I don't uh and 
we don't because I'm a, I, I'm a fucking jerk. I guess is is would be the reason. Man, I am uh, man, I'm an awful guy. I'm not an awful guy, but I've just I've done so much ridiculous stuff, and then I I wonder afterwards. I'm like, man, how come I don't uh, hang out with anybody? Here's why: because you're a dick. I'm uh, Barb is Barb and I don't get along. So we're at the 20th reunion. The 20th reunion ends. And it's time for uh, after-party weirdness. You know, the actual reunion was fun. It was really neat kind of seeing people that you went to school with. And there was no weird high school cliques and there was no weird tension, uh, you know, because you wound up talking to people. And But what was funny, too, is to see people that in high school who were uh, really, you know, hot or really this or that and to see how much they changed and then to see that they were all of a sudden really friendly. It's just like, oh, wow, now you're talking to me. That's great because I remember before uh, you weren't uh, – very friendly, you know, and it was funny. There's a girl in our class. I'm not going to say her name, but when, when the reunion was getting organized, she was really friendly on the message boards. And I told my friend, I go, I'm guaranteeing that she got fat. And he's like, what are you talking about? I go, you remember her? I go, cause she was like a stiff, like she wanted, she was always, she was nice and we got along with her, but she always had that arm's length thing going on. But now all of a sudden she's like, I can't wait to see all you people. This is gonna be fantastic. And I told my friend, I guarantee you she is a fucking house. And sure enough, we show up at the reunion and she comes stampeding in like a yak and she is a monster. And I knew it. I fuck, and, and believe me, I shouldn't even be talking cause this is before I had my surgery. So I ballooned in too, like the underdog balloon at the fucking Macy's day parade. But, uh, but still I, I was fat in school and was, you know, just fatter. She was like hot in school and all of a sudden, bang, she had, uh, she Volkswagened out nicely. And, uh, and I knew it too from, and it was funny. My buddy just looked at me, just nodded like, yep, you were right. So we, uh, the reunion though was really fun. It was, uh, we got along, everything was great, but then the reunion ends and all of a sudden things turn weird because now the weird high school click stuff kind of starts happening. And, uh, we get into an elevator where <laughs> there's like, there's like 10 of us in an elevator and uh, we, the door closes and there's a sign and it says no smoking. And Barb Wolf, who I don't really get along with very well, is smoking. And uh, and I even said, I go, hey, uh, no smoking, Barb. And uh, she's just like, oh, but, well, it's not a problem. We're only going up six floors and big deal. So what? You know, I'm, I'm nobody here has a problem with it except you, Mike. And she's talking and talking and talking. And uh, and so rather than just deal with that, because I knew she was talking to get to the floor where we were going to so she could smoke the whole time. Uh, she as I threw a glass of water in her face <laughs> and uh, because I was aiming for the cigarette. OK, she had a, she was like waving the cigarette around like big deal. If I'm smoking, who cares? You know, they try to make these laws and they tell you that you can't smoke in an elevator. But you know what? I, splash. I just threw like this. And the, literally the, the tension level in this elevator went. All of us are kind of like because it was tense anyway, because she and I are nitpicking at one another. And, uh, you know, literally, you ever see Porky's? Maybe you have it because, I, again, it's, it's a movie for people that are my age. But in Porky's, there was uh, this guy, Pee Wee, kept trying to get over on this one girl and they kept trying to play pranks on one another, uh, that kind of thing. And I, I don't think we were like that. We had more of a, a hatred base than the two of them, I would think. Although we get along fine now. Everything's great. But uh, and uh, that's a lie. Nothing's great. But I mean, I still I get along. If I see her, I'm pleasant to her and she's pleasant to me. But I, I don't think she likes me very much. And, and that's fine. I'm Again, as we've established, I'm kind of a jag off. So sure enough, she's waving the cigarette around. She's like, I don't know if I should stop smoking. Splash. Silence in the elevator. I mean, complete silence. But I see Max is he wants to laugh, but he can't laugh. He's just like looking at the wall like, oh, I can't like he can't believe I did it like he's he's always torn with me because he doesn't know whether to celebrate what I did or to be sick because he's like I can't believe you just fucking did that so it's quiet there's like this beat of complete silence and uh and she goes real mature Mike really nice you, you just you throw water on me real mature and it's quiet and I go I can't believe you didn't melt <laughs> and Max just goes oh because he really wants to laugh, but he can't. And, uh, and everybody else is just looking at me like I'm a dick. Because I am. There's no doubt. That was a dick move. I guarantee. I, I understand it was a dick move. But at the same time, it's a dick move to be smoking in an elevator with 10 other people. God damn it. Put your cigarette out. Be a grown up. But uh, yeah. So I said, I can't believe you didn't. I was pro. I, I, can't, I cannot tell you how proud I was, uh, how proud of myself I was for getting that that quick. <laughs> just splash. Oh, real mature, Mike. You throw water on me? I can't believe you didn't melt. Bang. <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, just Barb and I, we never got along. And, but she's really nice. I mean, I, you know, I'm sure she's really nice. And uh, and it's funny because she's like best friends with Dennis, who is also my friend. And, and which is weird because if she thinks I'm a jerk, what the fuck is she doing hanging around with Dennis? Dennis is a cock. I, I, just amazing. But uh, when we, we Dennis's 40th birthday party we went to and she brought her fiance 
and uh, he man he was a cool dude he was really really cool but uh he was this big dude and he was he had great he had, his skin was really red like like i don't know if he was sunburn or he was or that was who he was so so um we started calling him the beat because his skin was so crazy red we're like dude what's with the beat and uh and, and of course we're not telling we're not telling him that and we're not telling barb that and 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 then we all had to find tables uh, cause it was, it was a big party and there's probably like eight tables and they weren't, you know, yet. So you immediately got to figure out who you're sitting with. And, uh, it became a running joke with my friends were like, dude, I'm not getting saddled with the beat. Uh, again, nice guy, but just, it made us laugh to keep calling him the beat and keep saying we didn't want to sit with him because we're pricks. But, uh, but you know, that's, that's my friends. That's uh, the guy. It's funny. Yeah. I told the story about driving around. It seemed like whenever we'd get into cars, that's when shit would happen when you would do r- ridiculous stuff in a car. Uh, one time we went down to Chicago for a cub game and it's, uh, it was me. Dennis, Jeff, I think Ak was with us, my buddy Mike Akiyoshi, and uh, and and Max, and we went. Oh, and Pete, Pete Gogano was there. Oh, and Pete, dude, Pete is a piece of work. Pete is a guy none of us talk to anymore, but in school he was the greatest. Pete was beautiful. Pete was a guy. We went to a house party one time, and I I actually told this story before on Never Not Funny. We went to a house party, and it was a toga party, and the people having the party were younger than us. And uh, when we got to the door, we weren't wearing togas. They opened the door and uh, they said to Pete, they go, hey, where's your togas? And Pete flexed in this guy's face and goes, here's my fucking toga. And we walked in and they uh, they let us in because Pete had a giant arm. Pete, Pete was a guy, Pete wanted to bang in a girl in school and, uh, uh, he, and she became the bucket of mud from that point on in high school. She didn't know, uh, not, but because he banged her and he said it was like fucking a bucket of mud. So then for the rest of the high school career, we were just like, yeah, she, uh, what's the bucket of mud up to? That's what we would we would literally call her, the bucket of mud. Uh, yeah, Pete is a, uh, yeah, he's a rough house. Pete had the great, Pete was a guy, we were shooting pool one time with our buddy Kenny Haynes. Kenny Haynes, was, we used to call him the monster because he was 6'4", 280. He was a lineman on the football team. And uh, he was from Texas. And he was hysterical. Kenny Haynes is one of the funniest guys I ever met in my life. And, and, and uh he was shooting pool with Pete and he was winning and he was talking and he he had this way he would sing song talk. He'd be like, ah, I am crushing you in this pool game. Like that's how Kenny would talk. So he was saying it. Finally, Pete looked at him and goes, you know what, Kenny, you talk like Minnesota fast, but you play like Texas asshole. Guys from Texas drop that right in his face. Awesome. I loved Pete. So anyway, we go to Chicago and uh, we're driving to the Cub game and the Cub game winds up getting rained out. It was like, it was one of those weird days where where we live like 35 miles from Chicago and by us, it was like 75 degrees and sunny. By the time we got into the city, it was like 51 degrees and rainy. It was awful. So they wound up canceling the game. Uh, game was rained out. So then we were driving in Chicago and then it clears up, of course. So we're, we're driving, we're caught in traffic. And uh, every time we're, we're pulling up to a stoplight, there's a guy on a 10 speed who drives past us. And uh, it's just, you know, we're bored and we're kind of hot in the car and we don't know what to do. So we, we get to the stoplight and the guy passes us again. So I'm in the driver's, uh, I'm in the passenger seat. And I go, what the fuck is with this guy passing us all the time? Can we, is there a side street or something? And uh, Dennis was driving. And he's like, look, dude, just shut up. It, we're, we're fine. And then sure enough, the guy, zzz, guy sails right by us again. And I go, fuck this. I'm tired of this guy passing us. So as we go to pass him and go to the next light, we drive up. And I lean out the window, and this guy's on the 10 speed, and he, he doesn't have a shirt on, I should tell you that. And uh, he's driving, and he sees, he turns around, and just he just sees this fat behemoth hanging out of a passenger side window. He doesn't know what the fuck's going to happen. So I lean out, and he's on his bike, and I lean forward, and I smack him as hard as I fucking can on his back. For no reason. Just literally, I, just because I was tired of him passing us constantly, I, I just leaned out of the car and I smacked this guy as hard as I could on the back. And then we drove fast, you know, like <laughs> to get away from him. And I, we, everybody in the car, we're laughing. I, I finally, I'm on the floor, like literally on the floor of the car, hitting the seat, like, because <laughs> my hand hurts. I hit him because we're going, you know, 25 miles an hour. And I blasted this guy at his bike, like, you know, he kind of like shakily drove and it looked like he was going to crash or something. And we drive, but unfortunately it's the city. So we continue to drive. We have to stop at a stoplight. We're laughing. The whole car is laughing. We stop at the stoplight, and I look in the rearview mirror. He's coming. I mean, this guy's coming after us. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to fucking jam with this guy on the bike. So I, I'm ready for it. I'm waiting for him, and uh, to, probably because you know he had no idea what was going on. But he pulled past the car, and basically he spit at the car. Is all he did. That was his reaction. But the funniest thing is he spit at the car, and then he turned down a side street really fast. When he turned around. He had the hugest Andre the Giant fucking handprint on his back I think I've ever seen. It it looked like 
I had had a giant hand on a stick and just and tattooed him with it because apparently we were, we were going so fast. And again, I've got a giant hand. I think we covered that earlier in the show. And I hit him hard, like to make a smack noise. But it, for some reason, it was really comically big. Like it looked like someone had put a, a, a like a hand thing and then spray painted the rest of his back and left the hand. Oh, it was gorgeous. So uh, we couldn't stop laughing. But that's that's who you're dealing with, folks. A guy who smacked a guy for no reason on a bike in Chicago. I am not a good guy. Because that's who they are. You know, no matter what happens now, if they've grown up and they've done their thing. And, you know, my buddy Dave Wojcik. My buddy Dave Wojcik is a great guy. My, my buddy Dave Wojcik, is, he's married to his wife Linda. He's got beautiful kids. I think he's even found religion now. He's got an amazing job. And uh, But he's still going to be the guy who, uh, you know, wound up asking, would, would always ask you after your first date with someone if you fucked her in the mouth yet. That's who Dave Wojcik is. So, I mean, that's just my friends. And that's, I'm sure we've all got friends like that. And if you don't, maybe you should get some because these are pretty good guys. <laughs> uh, so there you go. So I, I guess, I guess, you know what, like I said, it's always a, a discovery for me, whether or not I'm a dick. A, am I, I, you know, I've done dickish things, but I don't think I'm a bad person overall. So, uh, and go ahead and by all means judge that. <laughs> go ahead and write me emails telling me whether or not you think I'm a jag off or not. Uh, I'm, I'm probably a jag off, but I'm still a decent fella. I'm, I'm a decent guy. I just, uh, you know, want to be in a prick. All right. Well, uh, so this is the first Sans Eric show. This is the first uh, Eric Butterfield less show. And I, again, I cannot stress enough how thankful I am to Eric because it was his idea to do this show. And it was uh, his hard work that got this show up and running. And I cannot tell you enough how much I appreciate it. And, uh, and I hope he's still listening. And I hope he understands just how much uh, what he did means to me. So that's great. I appreciate that. And also, uh, on the flip side, I want to thank Lily uh, for going ahead and taking over the production reins. Because honestly, when I got the email, because the email I got from Eric was funny. We did the show last week. And uh, the very next day, I got an email. And it just, it was Eric Butterfield. And it just said, don't be mad. That's what it said in the header of the email. And I went, oh, man, this is not going to be good, particularly after I spent 45 minutes tearing his wife down. I'm sure that this is not going to be a very good email. And uh, and he handled it in a, in a very gracious and very classy way, uh, just telling me, you know what, real life had interfered and he wasn't able to be involved anymore. So uh, I'm looking forward to getting my don't be mad email from Lily. I'm sure that'll be coming at some point. Uh, but, uh, I, I'm still, uh, I hope you guys are still on board with the show and, uh, I hope Eric is still on board. I hope everyone's still on board and, uh, you know what, am I a dick? I might be, but, uh, that's, you know, that's for me to figure out and, uh, and for you to enjoy, I suppose. Uh, all right. I want to tell you guys, you can go to Mike Schmidt uh, always go there and visit and, uh, learn and read the communiques and check out the appearances. Uh, as of right now, the appearances I do a lot, the, the shows I'm doing in town here are, I'm doing one nighters at like country clubs. And stuff so it's not like stuff i can put on the website because then people will you know because general real people can't come it's for you know fucking judge smales and the rest of the crew over there at the at the at the, at the country club uh they go and they dedicate their dinghies and then they come in and they laugh at me for an hour and a half uh and by an hour and a half i mean a half an hour because i am certainly not on stage for an hour and a half i'm barely in the room for an hour and a half uh, and also these gigs by the way i can't say fuck so Put, wrap your mind around that, Mike Schmidt on stage for 35 minutes, not being able to say that. Uh, and I can do it. I just choose not to when I talk to you guys or when I talk, uh, you know, at other shows that I can do on my own because I swear in real life. But, uh, uh, yeah, so that's that, – I'm doing shows, but unfortunately they're not shows that I can put on the website and have people come to. Uh, they're shows at, uh, at a country club uh, here and there. So all the people in Lake Forest know that I'm coming and they'll enjoy me soon enough in Oceanside and wherever else. Uh, but go to MikeSchmidtComedy.com for all communiques and appearances. You can write me there, of course. Go to MySpace.com slash MikeSchmidtComedy and be my friend. I think we've heard from this show, uh, I need more friends. <laughs> the guys I have have stuck with me through thick and thin, and I need to add to that number because eventually they're going to get tired of me, and I'm going to get a don't be mad email from the three of them, and then it's going to be just me solo banging my head against a wall talking to nobody. So by all means, be my friend through MySpace. Uh, so that's MySpace.com slash Mike Schmidt Comedy, and also go to MikeSchmidtComedy.com, and also go to ComedyFilmNerds.com and go read The Back Row with Mike Schmidt. Uh, I've only got two columns up, but I should have a third by the time this is out. Um, although I, it all depends on the editing and what they do over there, but, uh, I should write uh, another one. I'm, I'm partway through it, whatever, who cares, but, but go to comedyfilmnerds.com and, uh, check out the stuff that I write there. Okay. And read all the communiques and stuff, the website and, uh, enjoy yourselves, please. By all means, read everything and listen to everything that I've done and go ahead and take that to the bank that I'll always be there for you. I'll be a web presence. You can always appreciate because as long as they're not paying, I'm going to be participating because God knows there's nothing I like more than going ahead and churning out content for people who aren't paying for it. 
Not that you guys should be paying for it. I'm not saying that. By all means, go ahead and just jump on board. Thank you for listening, and thank you for reading, and thank you for being there and being on my mailing list. And by the way, uh, this is hurtful. I, I get a mailing list, and I send out an email to everybody telling them all the time to go ahead and just jump on and you know listen to podcasts. I got a letter from a guy this week. Please take me off your spam list. I'm not spamming anybody. I personally write those emails. I'm not trying to get your dick bigger or give you a fucking lower mortgage, for God's sakes. I'm just trying to get you to listen to a podcast. I don't think that's spam. And I write a very entertaining little blurb inside of the email. If you don't like it, don't read it. Go ahead and delete it. Or even write me in the you don't want my take me off your list. But don't call me a spammer, because I take that personally, quite frankly. Especially for a guy who does all of his non-paying business on the web. I don't know why you would go ahead and write something like that to me, because I am a guy invested in this. I am certainly not spamming anybody. So by all means, guy i am not a good guy but i don't think i'm a bad person overall so uh and go ahead and by all means judge that <laughs> i'm kind of a jag off i got the future what am i talking about but i am a jag off uh, and i'm not a jerk i'm a nice guy it's just i guess i have jerky tendencies i've done so much ridiculous stuff and then i, I wonder afterwards i'm like man how come i don't uh, hang out with anybody here's why because you're a dick Yeah, 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 yeah